here that you want to access later, you can access that too. Okay. So we are actually pretty fortunate here in Northwest Montana that we have lots of plants that grow very well with very little extra care. Um, so I've kind of compiled a list here. It's not in any particular order, but things that I feel grow well here. Oh, I should back up. We do have a farm, a vegetable farm, and we've been growing in the valley now for about seven years. Um, there are things that I do not grow well. I'll just put that out there. There are always challenges. But at the top of the list here, we have a large group called the brassicas, and that includes everything that you see there, the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, mustard, kale, arugula, kohlrabi. All of those items are cool season crops. They do quite well here. Um, they don't require a lot of extra coddling to grow. However, those crops are susceptible to a few insects. So that is where they require some attention. Um, we like to use something I'll probably talk about several times here tonight. It's called a, a row cover, floating row cover, a frost blanket. It's a white woven material. Um, we use it, you can use the heavier weight ones are for frost, but we use the lighter weight ones for um, insect exclusion. And uh, if you've ever grown these, you know that they get caterpillars like um, cabbage moths, loopers, and diamondback moths. Those are both caterpillars. They also get uh, flea beetles, which are not a flea at all. They're a beetle, but they're little black shiny insect that hops like a flea. That's why they're called flea beetles. So anyway, just so you know, they do really well here. The flea beetles just eat the leaves and make them aesthetically unpleasing, but they're still fine to eat. The caterpillars chew on the crops. Your broccolis and your cauliflower is not such a big deal. You can just dunk them in salt water when you harvest them and those things all come squiggling off. The cabbages are a little less exciting when uh, you cut into your cabbage and you find Warmed in. So there's also, if you're worried, if that's a problem for you, if you can't use a fabric to sort of exclude those insects on the, oh, aphids also really like the kales, particularly by about August, so it is nice to protect them. There are products out there that are organic. They're safe for soaps that help keep the um, insects off. It actually dries out the aphids body and then they die. Um, there's a product called BT, it's Bacillus thuringiensis that you can get. It's organic, it's a bacteria. And when the cabbage loopers or the diamondback moth larva feed on that, it's actually a biological warfare that destroys their digestive tract. Um, what, was, what is that called? Um, it's BT, it's Bacillus thuringiensis. And I know that you can get, um, I think there's a product called like, Thuricide, thurgicide, but if you look for BT, okay. um, you'll find it. And I feel like I've gotten it before at Box of Rain. You do have to sort of apply it weekly. Um, it photodegrades, this, meaning the sun um, makes it doesn't last long. If it rains, it gets washed off. Um, if I'm lazy, I just put fabric out over my things. <laughs> The other things that grow well here are spinach and lettuces, both head lettuces like bibs, romaines, butterheads, um, even iceberg grows well here. The trick with spinach, which I'll try not to repeat again later, uh, is spinach doesn't like warm soil, so it's good to plant now versus it's not going to do so well in July and August. Um, even though we are in a cool growing climate, July and August, the soil temperatures get hot for spinach and it tends to not germinate. And if it does germinate at that time, it tends to bolt um, or go to flower. Your peas, green beans, radishes, turnips, those all do real well. Oh, again, if you have grown radishes and turnips in the past and had root maggots in them, um, not so desirable. Uh, using some sort of a fabric over them, again, it deters the fly from landing on, on them or by them in the soil, laying their eggs, and then that, that egg hatches and then feeds on those crops. So if you've had the issue in the past, the best deterrent for there is some sort of a screen um, or a, a lightweight fabric to keep the flies up. Beets, potatoes, zucchinis, cucumbers, winter squash, those all do really great here. 
um, dill, cilantro, parsley. Uh, the only thing with parsley and carrots, they're in the same family, and so are parsnips. Um, sorry, that's not on the list, but that does well here as well. Those are take a long time to germinate, so be patient with them. Um, my advice is to prepare your soil out in the garden, however you do that. Plant them, cover them with a little bit of soil, and then water them. And there again, if you can cover the soil with something, it'll make it so your soil stays moist throughout germination. I'm probably going to say that like 10 times tonight, I saw. But it's so important, um, particularly when something takes three weeks, you kind of get tired of watering the grass, watering that soil and seeing nothing. But if you can put something down, a piece of plastic, a piece of fabric, maybe even some newspaper, what that does is as the sun comes out and warms the soil, the water actually evaporates out of the soil. It will get trapped on whatever barrier you put there and it will condensate and fall back down. And it will really help you get a good stand on your carrots, uh, meaning good germination. Mm, any questions? Okay. Plants that require a little more TLC. Um, I think these are more of the sought after and loved plants that here are crops that we can grow. But these okay. crops here. Brooke, before we move on, we had one question in oh, the chat. Sorry. If, uh, oh. if BT harms the gut of the insects, would it not also potentially harm our guts too? Oh, that's a great question. Um, no, because you're probably going, you're not going to be eating the leaves of your cauliflower and broccoli and you're going to wash it off and it washes right off. Um, and your intestinal tract is much larger uh, than that of a caterpillar. I suppose if you drank the bottle, it could have problems. Um, but it's such a small dose. And like I said, it, the sun makes it go away. And that's why you have to apply it a lot. Uh, like you usually apply it in the evening if you're going to put it out. Um, but no, it is deemed safe for you. That's a great question. Is there another question? I don't see these little chat questions. You had a question about the uh, turnips. I've always had the turnips have little worms in them. Is that, is that the, what you're talking about, the root maggots? That's correct, sir. Um, yeah, so um, if you can do, I don't know, like if... Uh, like a household screen, like if you had extra household screen around, if that is a, I would think that would be tight enough. I mean, flies can't get through that. Um, but again, the floating row covers are really helpful. And you just lay them over it and, you know, we see you staple them to the ground or you could put sandbags or you can shovel soil edges. and. Your crop can live under that till harvest. It's not the prettiest. I mean, you're like, this time of the year, I feel like we grow rows of white fabric, but it really helps a lot. And it keeps those, particularly those root maggots away because there's nothing more dis, uh, disheartening than going out to harvest your turnips or your radishes um, and having them full with root maggots. I mean, you can still eat it, you just cut it off. It's kind of sad. Hey, Brooke, one more question um, from okay. uh, Geffen. What type of covers for carrots to help them germinate? Um, you could use like plastic if you had some plastic around. If you're using clear plastic, like from the hardware store, usually like, um, like visqueen is usually not UV treated. So it's going to break down fast in the sun and turn into like a bazillion little pieces of plastic. You probably get one year out of it, but if you can find some greenhouse plastic, that would be great. Or again, the floating row covers. Um, we use that a lot as a little bit of a cheater. I think newspaper would be fine if you wanted to do sort of like a little lasagna garden out there. Um, you could probably try cardboard, anything like that, just to try to help. You could probably even do uh, some straw, like a light, a light uh, dusting of straw would help keep that soil moisture in too. Good. Question. Okay, so the yeah. Uh, is it a little bit early to put tomato plants in the ground? 
Yes, sir. It is a little bit early to put tomato plants in the ground unless you have um, wall of waters, which I've never used because we have so many tomatoes that we put out. Um, so I hold off. But those little wall of waters, I know f I have friends who have, you know, gardens in their yard and um, those things are amazing. Mm -hmm. I would wait. I'm sorry? You call it wall of waters? Yeah, wall of waters. They're this thing that you buy and they're it's a ring and they're tall like this and they're bladders and you fill them with water and then you put that over your plant. And so the, the water sort of, it makes like a little greenhouse that's made with water um, and they warm up and then in the night they radiate that heat. And I have friends who have had extreme, very uh, successful early season with their tomatoes. But otherwise, if you don't have a way to protect them, I would be cautious about putting any of these sensitive plants here out much before like May 20th. If you do put them out earlier, just be prepared to put something over them in the event of a frost. Uh, it can be anything. It could be a paper bag, just something to keep the frost from settling on those tender plants and burning those leaves. Um, if you, I live up in Whitefish. If you live in part of the valley, your dates are going to be a little bit, um, like if you live closer to the lake or in Big Fork or Lakeside, you're, you could probably put stuff out a little bit earlier in May, like maybe May 10, because you guys are, are really are a bit warmer down there. Um, but yeah, so I would hold off on your tomatoes, peppers. Basil is the most sensitive, I swear. If you just walk by it and say 32 degrees, it gets frosted. Um, so really be careful with your basil. So these plants do grow well here, but they require a little bit extra love. Um, they do sell, what these plants all want are warm roots. It's, the plants grow from their roots. Uh, so it's okay sometimes if the foliage is cool, but what happens here is that our soils cool down in the night as well, and so the plants actually stop growing. So what we want to try and do is warm that soil, keep that soil warm through the night. So obviously if you have like a little greenhouse structure, that's easy way to help keep the soil warm. And if you do have a small greenhouse structure uh, that's not heated, Right now, you can put your starter plants out there. I would probably watch your nighttime temperatures and bring them in in the night. We used to do a lot of that when we just had a smaller operation. Every night, I would lug all of our plants back inside, and then in the morning around 8, 8.30, I'd bring them all outside and put them in my greenhouse, let them be out there all day, and then I'd bring them back in the night. We did that for years before we had a heated greenhouse. Um, the other things that you can do is they do sell like a plastic um, mulch. It's a real thin plastic mulch and there's actually black plastics too. You can do that uh, and cut holes in it and plant your plant through there. If you do that, make sure you have a way to get water to the plants, whether you're using a drip irrigation or soaker hose underneath or that you can manually water through the hole in which you've planted your crop. Another trick is you can plant them close to a building. Uh, I don't know if you have flower gardens next to your buildings, but maybe you can make a room for a couple of tomatoes. They look nice in your perennial gardens. But your house, particularly the south side and the west side, are going to give off heat all night, and that foundation is definitely warming the soil. I mean, any plants that I have close to my house, perennials, are up way before the ones that are out in the gardens away from the house. Um, uh, any questions about those plants? Oh, the other thing is your basil, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants all also can go in containers if you want to have them like on your porch or your deck or you want to be able to bring them in. The tomatoes, though, I would recommend close to at least a, like a five-gallon type container, something that big. The other plants, not the melon and corn. We haven't talked about melon and corn yet. Other plants I would put in, you can put in like a smaller container. When you do container planting though, or gardening, it's very important that you have a good fertilizer program. 
all the nurseries, the grow stores, the uh, hardware stores have plethora of products. Just take the time to find a product that you're comfortable with. Um, that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, but I would start as soon as, if you're going to do container gardening, as soon as you get it planted, get on a, get yourself on a schedule, on a routine, and uh, put in some sort of fertilizer, like a liquid fertilizer, every week. Because what will happen is your nutrients will get washed out and, and the plants will use them up, particularly on your tomatoes. And by the time you recognize it in the plant, your savings account of nutrients in the soil is in the negative. And so then you're trying to get the plant caught back up. Melons and corn. Um, they just require lots of heat. And we do live in the Rocky Mountains. So they would also enjoy some sort of soil warming, like a plastic mulch or the sunniest place that you have. Anything you can do to try to help that. Uh, soil be warmer. Um, we also start even, we start all of these crops inside and transplant them out, including the corn, which we'll get to. But that is how we get our corn. We plant our corn straight into beds without any plastic mulch. We start them, we'll be starting them on May 1st and then planting them out around May 20th. And that just gets them up and out of the ground because we do have cold soils and they will just sort of sit in there and potentially rot. So seeds that you can sow now directly into your garden. Um, I'm gonna, I just alphabetize this list, but I'm actually gonna break it apart. If you're interested in uh, like leafy green type items, like your arugulas, if you like beet greens, um, baby chard, baby kale, uh, baby, like loose leaf lettuce, not head lettuce, uh, spicy greens like mustards and spinach, we're going to call those all your leafy greens. Uh, you would plant those out now and you would sow them relatively densely, maybe about an inch apart or so. And then they're going to come up. Um, and those, all of those should come up within about seven, one to two weeks, depending the location that you're planting them in, if it's direct sun or if it's shady well, you know, impact that a little bit in the temperatures. But like we put out arugula on April 9th and it, and loose leaf lettuce, my spinach isn't up yet, but anyways, we planted some of those April 9th and they're through the soil now. So today's the 22nd. So they were up on Monday. So that's about a week and a half, just so you have an idea. Oh, and radishes too. Those should only take about seven to 10 days. But those are your leafy greens. You can plant those densely. And you can plant them out now, cut them, maybe you'll get like two or three harvests off of them, and then that individual planting would be done. Now, if you're after uh, a large like kale plant that's going to get big and you want big kale leaves and chard and mustards, if you like large mustards, you can also plant those outside right now. What I would recommend is making um, a little divot, you know, in the soil and putting about two to three seeds in those holes and having those little holes be approximately a foot is kind of close to 18 inches. I think often we tend to cram our plants and they really do like space. But you can plant those now outside if you want to. And then as they germinate, you're gonna have to be diligent and pick one to survive and take the other ones as little guys and eat them. Um, the plants will do much better if they're single, if you're after that large one. Uh, beets and carrots. Um, sorry, carrots I already talked about. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, carrots already talked about those, about being patient. Um, beets, you can sow those quickly for beet greens, as I talked about, and then you can thin them. You can also sow them, say, like every two inches. And a beet seed is big, so you can see it, and it's easy to, you know, plant them spaced out. Plant them about two inches apart, and then uh, har when they get to be about baby beet size, you can harvest every other one, say. And then you leave the other ones there, which are now about four inches apart, and you'll get large beets. 
Um, it's kind of nice versus sewing them four inches apart and waiting a really long time before you get to eat your big beets. So it helps you have like baby beets and then big beets. Uh, dill and cilantro, you can go ahead and seed those right now. Um, if you like dill, like the leaf part for, for seasoning, go ahead and plant that thickly. If you're more looking for the dill seed pickle with, you might want to do, either delay planting so it nicks up when, when cucumbers are ready um, or plant it again a little bit later and then you would want to get it more space so you get more heads on your dill plant. Um, let's see. Hey Brooke, peas, question. You put the peas. Yeah. Can, can, can you repeat, repeat how often you harvest your baby beets? Is it every other week? Oh, uh, how often I harvest my baby beets? That just depends. Oh, the greens? Yeah, for beet greens, um, they grow really fast. So when I go in for beet greens, I've seeded them pretty thick, like maybe every half inch to inch. And when they get to be maybe three to four inches tall, depends how big you like your beet greens to be, you can cut them off. Uh, like the, just maybe just leave um, like an inch of the stem beneath and it will just grow back. Not from what you leave, but from the seed in the ground, the roots in the ground, it'll grow back and you can harvest that again like in two weeks. And you can, you can probably on beet greens, you could probably get maybe three harvests out of them. Then they just start, you'll notice, they just don't look so thrifty and they're trying to go to seed. Because all plants want to do is produce fruit for seed so that they can keep existing. Um, so when you do, I have a little note down there that plant according to packet instructions and overcrowding causes bolting. And bolting is when it goes to flower and produce seeds. So when we plant crops like we've talked about for your baby greens, um, we are stressing them out. We're saying, I'm going to densely plant you because I want to eat your leaves when they're little. And so that, that actually creates stress as the roots are getting bigger underground. They're like, hey, we're so crowded in here. I'm just going to go ahead and bolt and see to be done with it. Um, so that's something you see a lot, particularly like with cilantro, arugula, your beets will start to do that after a while. Just seed multiple times, which we'll get to. So potatoes, I have a little asterisk there on potatoes, and maybe you've read ahead. But potatoes, we can go ahead and start planting potatoes now. Um, when I plant potatoes, I look at the potato, and you'll see the eyes or the little divots on the potatoes. I like to take my potatoes out. We keep them in the cooler so they're not sprouting yet because we've already received our seed potatoes in March and we don't plant them to now. So we keep them cool and dark so they don't sprout. So now we're gonna pull them out and let those eyes start to sprout a little bit. And then I look at my potato and usually you can cut them in half, just make sure there's some a decent amount of eyes on the potato. If there's only eyes on one side, then don't cut it. Um, we like to cut them and let them dry for overnight and plant them the next day. We dig a trench maybe about six inches deep or so, and we put the potatoes in there, and then we, we bring the soil back on, maybe only like four inches of soil, and then as the potatoes um, emerge and the foliage comes up, we hill back the rest of that soil. If you're really good, you need to hill your potatoes and increase your yield. That's like doing it every week. I don't have the time to do that. The biggest reason for hilling your potatoes is so as the tubers form, they usually form right under the soil surface, and you don't want the sunlight to penetrate the soil and cause your potatoes to turn that green color. It's, it's, you're not supposed to eat the green part of the potatoes. The note I have on here about seed potato is, I don't know if you're all aware, but we, Montana actually has a seed potato economy. We grow, not me, but there's seed growers, farmers in the state that specifically grow seed potato. Most of it's exported to Idaho and Washington. And then those places grow potatoes that then you purchase in the store to eat or that go to like McDonald's and potato chips. But Montana grows a lot of seed potato. 
So to protect our seed potato growers and that economy, we don't want to be bringing in seed potatoes from other states because you may be bringing in viruses and diseases that can spread to those farms. So if you need seed potatoes, um, these are some of the areas I have listed on the screen that carry um, seed potato grown in Montana. And also our extension agent, it's the ordering period has now passed, but if you ever get in touch with our county extension uh, in Kalispell, they also can help you get source seed potato in the future. Um, I think I touched on everything on that slide. Continuous planting. So we started alluding to that a little bit earlier um, with things bolting. So basically here is your leafy greens and some of your herbs uh, like cilantro and dill uh, to plant those about every two weeks to have a continuous supply. I have a little note there that spinach, and I think I mentioned it earlier, doesn't like our warm summers. However, you can trick it, you can be clever, you can plant it in your shady areas. You can also plant it on the north side of crops, like say you have some peas. Peas are tall and they cast quite a shadow. You can plant your spinach, uh, like say late June, early July, on the north side of those items. Um, same with your tomatoes. Anything that's tall and casting a shadow, put your spinach over there um, and it should germinate just fine. Um, shady or, or a shady spot is great too. Um, I have a note there too that cilantro, uh, even though it's often used in a lot of um, Mexican or Latino dishes, it surprisingly does not like the heat. So uh, go ahead and put that also in your cooler areas in the middle of the summer and give it space like four inches between each crop or each plant and um, it will be much happier. Okay, uh, seeds to start inside now. This is the list of everything you can start inside now. Um, the charred kale and head lettuce have that little asterisk next to it indicating that if you chose to just direct seed it outside with a greater spacing, then don't bother starting it inside. Chard can be a little bit, uh, Swiss chard can be a little bit finicky about transplanting. Uh, we do it just because, but um, just so you know, that one can be a little bit challenging. Um, if you you know, try to say whatever for whatever reason or color or in the farmers market or wherever. Um, all is possible. If those plants are stressed for you, equally when you plant them outside, they really like about two feet between plants. So make sure you give them a lot of space, otherwise you're just gonna end up with a little button size head and you're gonna be like, well, that's pointless. Um, winter squash, surprisingly with its name being winter, it likes, and your melons like really warm soil to germinate. So if you're starting those inside right now, try to put them in your warmest loom. Um, I mean, everything likes to be warm, but those particular like soil temperatures around, um, I think like 65 degrees, 70 degrees. So just don't put them in the coolest part of your house. Put them in where it's warmer. And if you have, they do sell like growing heat mats that you can get if you want that. That would help along, but just so you know, they can be a little bit touchy at times. All right, sorry, but it's too late to start these crops. <laughs> if you still have, if, if you did, if you have in your possession some peppers, eggplant, or tomato seeds, go ahead and plant them. Um, it's just a seed. If you have some time, a minimal expense invested, if it's a variety you really want, but know that you could, you're pushing the window. Onions and shallots and leeks, that's the very first thing. We start those from seed in early March. Um, if you just want like green onions or scallions, that's fine, you have time to start those. But if you're looking for storage onions and things like that, uh, 
I would not recommend at this point in time starting them from seed. You can find those onion sets, those little or onion bulbs. And then you can also find onion slips. They look like a scallion from the grocery store. Um, and I imagine that some of the nurseries around town have those for sale. And those you could buy now and just plant them right outside. They will look terrible. They look like they're gonna die when you put them out. Just keep watering them and you'll see the new green growth coming. Um, with our current state of COVID-19, it's my understanding that our farmers markets will be happening. So uh, just stay tuned for that as far as starting dates, but you should be able to also source plants there. But lots of farms have online markets. We actually have an online farmers market where you can access, um, at this point in time, so you can pre-order starter plants from several farms around the valley, if, if that's something you're interested in. Um, and that's at wickedgoodproduce.com. Okay, seed starting basics. All seeds need soil, water, air, light, and warmth to grow, of uh, plants, seeds and plants. So, soil. There's many, many types of potting soil out there. We like uh, this product called Pico. It's actually produced in Big R, Montana. If you're ever driving down Highway 93 towards Missoula, it's on the right-hand side. Ted has a funny sign out there that says something open by appointment or by chance. But I've given you his number because he's not, you won't find a website or anything like that. Um, and you can call and pick up uh, bags. We They also sell large totes if you have the ability to move. It is a 700 pound tote. Uh, he can load it for you, but when you get home, you have to be able to offload it. It's a great product. If you're uh, building raised beds, you could put that in there. We find the smaller bags, the white bag is non-organic, and then the like um, yellowy tan bag is an organic. So he has two products down there. Um, but we've been able to find those here in Whitefish at WBC um, as well. But there's, there's so many potting soil out there. Um, just find something that you're comfortable with and go for it. Most, and the reason I recommend potting soil to start your plants with versus soil from the garden is that potting soil has, usually has a lot of peat moss on it, so it's light and fluffy. And then they also add things like vermiculite and perlite that allow it to uh, create air space in there for your roots. Um, typical garden soil can be heavy. It may not, it might get too, uh, or it might have a lot of clay, or it could be real sandy depending where you live. Um, and for your little seedlings, it's nice maybe just to start with potting soil. And they usually have a baseline of fertilizer in there. Um, so that's the soil. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh -huh. I sound really uh, not in the know, but what is WBC? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you for asking. That's Western Building Center. Oh, okay. I know yep. that. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you for asking. Yep. Um, but there's, I like them because Ted's a wonderful gentleman down in Big Arm. Their product, I think almost all the organic growers in the state are bought, use his product, so it's proven. And it's local, so it's not him. And he's just a wonderful person. <laughs> he's a character. Uh, so anyway. Hey, Brooke, we have a question. Uh, when okay. do you start your tomatoes, if you're going to start them next year? Oh, I start my tomatoes on March 17th. It's a date, a starting date I inherited from my grandparents, and it's easy to remember because it's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so right around the middle of March or the Ides of March is when we start them. Um, and we just moved them up from our, what we call little plug tray into four inch pots uh, because they grow, they take a long time to grow and then they get big. Uh, and so anyways, today we just potted all of ours up into the next size pot. And then they'll live in that, today's the, they'll live in that four inch pot for about another month. We won't put them, we put ours out in a greenhouse, in a, like a high tunnel, a hoop house in the field, but we still won't put them out there. It's not heated. We won't put them out there till the end of May. So they've got one more month inside our little heated greenhouse. Um, again, don't let your seedlings dry out during germination. Um, we talked about potting soil. It's lofty. It's good for you. And light. 
Once your seedlings germinate, make sure they have a good light source. Now, if all you have is the window, that's fine. Your, your plants are going to grow and lean towards that light. Just rotate them every day. Make them get a little exercise. So they're gonna lean one day and then you're gonna lean them back the next day and it will help them from getting quite so leggy, but they will grow long. If you have supplemental light, like um, I call them shop lights, like a fluorescent lighting unit that you can buy like at Home Depot or something like that. They have different light bulbs, they have full spectrum, they have ones for plants. Those lights don't put out a lot of heat, but they put out a lot of If you're using those, you wanna make sure they're close to your plants, like an inch from the top of the plant. Otherwise, if you have um, six inches above the plants, they're gonna grow and become leggy, so it's kinda of counterproductive. If you're good using a light source from some of these, um, I don't know, indoor growing light systems that they sell. I don't really know that much about them. They seem very high powered. I just ask somebody about them if you're buying them, how close you should put them to your plants. But I'm only familiar with the sort of cheap shop lights that are the fluorescent ones. You keep them really close, like almost touching the plants. It won't burn them. Okay, moving along, because I want to make sure we have time for questions um, or for more questions. How to start your seeds. So we have your soil mix. It's really important to hydrate that soil um, because so many potting soils are composed of some sort of peat moss. Peat moss is um, hydrophilic. It loves the water. So it's going to pull in. First of all, it sort of doesn't mix in there, but then that peat moss is like a sponge and it's going to absorb the water. So what happens is if you don't moisten your water, it's good, or moisten your soil before you put it in your container, and then you put your seed in it, it's gonna compress, and your soil and your seed are gonna be competing for the water. So just hydrate your soil first. Take your potting soil, if you have a wheelbarrow, a pail, whatever you have, mix large. If you have a big uh, pot that you were gonna put something in later, you can use that. Just mix it in with some water. Uh, I like to say it's like a dry brownie mix. So you kind of tumble it around, stir it up. Then you have a nice dampened soil mix that you're gonna put into your containers. And then you're gonna fill your containers. Uh, don't compress it too much. Keep, just give it a little tamp down to like pack it in there. But again, we want air in there. So you don't want it to be too compressed or compacted. Um, here's a photo of some of the Soil uh, seed starting containers we use um, were a slightly different scale, but I just wanted to share with you different size cells. So on the, let's see, can you see my mouse? Is my mouse moving on your screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So over here, this is, this is what we call a 128. That's not really important. The important part is that they're small. And this say, there's 128 cells here. So we would use this for um, planting our broccolis because the broccoli is a small seed. When it germinates, it's a small plant. It lives in here for about four weeks. It gets a nice little root ball, and then I can pull them out of there. These are called plug trays, because it makes, looks like a plug, I guess. Um, if you have one of these, that's great. Uh, you can use this for most of the things we've talked about starting inside at this point. This one's a little bit bigger. This is. It's the same area, but this is 72 cells. Um, so this is something that I started my tomatoes in uh, because I let them live in here for a month. And like today when we started transplanting our tomatoes, which we transplanted into this, a four inch pot today, um, they're like five to six inches tall in here. And so now it's time for them to have this much space. Um, but if you happen, I, I know in the past I've been able to get these at the nurseries like plant lamb. Uh, they're a couple of dollars a piece. Um, say you had this one here in the middle. You can, you don't have to plant the whole thing with one crop like I do because I have hundreds of plants I put out. But you can use this and do, you know, two rows of kale. You know, you can put your dill here, your cilantro. I mean, you could plant your whole garden theoretically in here. This is a six pack. You probably have some of these perhaps in the garage. 
or the basement from last year. Um, this is really a nice size for starting your winter squash, your summer squash, and your cucumbers because they like some space. And then you don't have to, and when they germinate, they're big. I mean, it's a big seed to start. So when the leaves come out, the first leaves, the cotyledons come out, they're pretty big. Th these two sides, this you could get away with them. This is like way too small. Um, so this would be great for something like that. And you can, if you want, you can put two seeds in there and then just plant them like that or pull one out. Um, oh, something I didn't talk about before is germination rates. When you look at your seed packet, look for where it says, it'll say, it might say germ 90%, germ 80%. So before they've sold the seeds, they've taken say 100 seeds and germinated them and then counted them. There's 90% out of 190 or 90 germinated. There's something to be mindful of when you are planting your seeds. If say you're going to put in butternut squash and it says 75% germination rate, it is what it is. You can't change that and plant more than you need. So say you want 10 plants, maybe plant 20 seeds. 20 seeds or 15 seeds um, just to accommodate for some of them not germinating. Don't be upset if they don't all germinate. It just happens. Um, and then here's a slightly smaller six pack that you could use for starting uh, some smaller things like your greens or your head lettuces could go in here. This would be a great size for your head lettuces. This would be a little bit big for your head lettuces to start in. Um, but use what you have. Uh, and then this is a forage pot. And I mean, if that's what you've got, just use it. Other things that you might have are egg cartons. These work wonderfully well. Fill them in with soil, seed in there. Uh, they're great. And you probably have egg cartons, I'm guessing. Uh, this is another thing that works really well. It's like, you know, you can repurpose your salad green box into a mini greenhouse. Fill this with soil. I would put um, a few drainage holes in the bottom of something like this, as well as if you're using um, single serve uh, yogurt containers or a large yogurt container, like cut it down so it's only like two inches tall, put a couple holes in there, or um, what do you else? Sour cream containers, anything like that. And just put a few, punch a few holes in the bottom, or if you have a drill and a drill bit, that works out well too. Uh, just something so when you water it, if you overwater, that water can escape and not cause rotting. Having said that, make sure whatever you're growing in, you have something to catch water. Cookie sheets work great if you don't mind repurposing your cookie sheets. Uh, boot trays, I'm just trying to think of things that you might have, but just know that it is going to, it is a little bit messy. The other thing I like to do when seeding is cover uh, your egg carton or any of these other cells with a piece of saran wrap. That will ensure, just like we talked about with the carrots, during the day when the soil warms, if you have them in a sunny location, you have that evaporation, it condensates on that saran wrap and then falls back down and keeps the soil moist um, so you don't let your seedlings dry out during that germination period. Another thing you can use is a little spray mister bottle to keep the soil surface moist. However, I wouldn't rely on spray misting as your only uh, watering source during this time. I just don't feel like you're going to mist it enough that the whole soil uh, profile gets moist. Okay, so that's how to start your seeds. Uh, now I'm going to talk, any questions on that? Does it make sense? Oh, one thing I didn't mention is how deep to plant your seeds, both when you're starting them and out in the field or out in your garden. Um, we tend to do twice the, twice the depth of the seed. So some seeds are really tiny, so you're only burying them maybe like a quarter of an inch. Um, some seeds are bigger, like your cucumbers. Those are big seeds. You're going to put them, let's see if I can make these go by. Say you put this in your six pack. It's going to be about almost halfway down in this cell. Maybe a little bit, 
between a quarter or halfway down in the cell, depending how full you have of soil. But that's a good uh, gauge, I think, is twice the depth that the seed is. Okay, so now you've started your seed. They're growing, fast forward like three weeks from now, and you're ready to transplant things out. I've given you a couple basic patterns, uh, and this is just, you can just do straight rows, I'm fine with that, um, but if you're trying to squeak in more plants in, in your area, this, uh, this pattern is really great for head lettuces. Um, you can also do your chard and kale this way. This way here would be, on your chard and kales, would be about a foot to 18 inches apart, and then this would be about nine inches apart, and then you would repeat the pattern along. And then this is about 18 inches apart this way. Um, hey, Brooke, we have a question from the last oh, cool. slide. Um, sorry to interrupt, but um, do you leave seeds covered in plastic in bright light during the day? I do. Yeah, I do. And then as soon as the as soon as they start to germinate, you want to remove that plastic. Now, if you had taken my idea and taken something like this and put multiple species of plants in here, some are going to germinate faster than others. You should still remove the plastic to allow the, the seedlings to come up. But, okay. One uh, more question. It, it, yeah. Um, do you sterilize your old pots and six packs before you use them again? You should. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> <laughs> you should even if you just hose them off uh, I don't know if you if you're fine with bleach you could do a bleach water solution I've worked in nurseries years ago that every year we sterilize them in some sort of like a soapy bleach water or there are other products out there and we use garbage bins and we would dunk them in there and what you're trying to do is get rid of um, any sort of fungus that might be in there um, I honestly, in the last seven years, have never washed or sterilized any of my containers because we reuse these plug trays every year. I just sort of knock the soil out and keep, just go for it. So I'm, I'm going to tell you it's a good practice, but I don't practice it. That's a great question. One more question. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> once, once the seeds have germinated, do you keep them on a heat pad at night? and still cover at night? So once they've germinated, I remove the cover, particularly if the cover is flat. Um, I've seen uh, where you can buy these little plastic covers that are elevated, you know, but if you're using saran wrap, you want to take that off. But they do make these like little mini plastic domes that go over some seed trays. Those you could keep on and if the plants start to put on, touch them, then you're going to want to take it off. Um, but yes, uh, we do keep our seedlings on once they've germinated on heat mats for for a good period of time. It just gives them an advantage, um, particularly your winter squash and cucumbers. Uh, those could stay on the heat mat. They don't have to, but if you're if you don't need that space, if you don't need that heat mat for another. Uh, planting then just leave them on there they won't it'll be fine and most like they sell these nice little heat mats and they usually don't get too hot um we have some heat mats that get pretty hot and so we have a, a soil probe that goes into the cells and we can set the soil temperature it's like um it's a soil temperature probe, I guess, that has an outlet. So we plug that into our outlet and then we plug the heat mat into that and I can set it. So if I don't, if I want my soil to stay a minimum of 70 degrees, it allows the electricity to, it, it's like a thermostat. It clicks on the outlet when the soil temperature gets below 70 degrees and heats it up. And then once it gets over 70, it probably has a range of like two or three degrees. Once it gets over that, it turns it off and lets the soil cool down. And then when it gets cold again, it gets below 70, it kicks back on. But I think the little ones that you can buy, um, they, because we used to have those, they only go up to like maybe 70 degrees. They're going to get like 90 degrees and potentially cook your plants. 
So just learn about your products before you buy them, I guess. Okay, whoops. So yeah, planting patterns. Uh, this is so we can get uh, a lot of plants in a small space. These are not to scale. This is just the design. You would have to follow the seed packet, which says how to plant, like if it says 18 inches apart. This is the pattern here, where it's just the two set the black X's that we use for broccoli and cauliflower. So it's like two feet apart here, but probably only like 18 inches apart this way. But it's just a nice way you can zigzag versus just a single row. But there's nothing wrong with single rows. And the little green dots in the bottom are for like your peas, your uh, beets, radishes, turnips, things like that. Okay, this next resource is one I think you all will want. This is from the Good Seed Company. Um, Robin, the owner of the Good Seed Company, is also part of Free the Seeds. And this, I was getting ready to prepare something like this for you all. And I'm like, it exists. I know it exists. I've seen it. I've had it in my hand. So I emailed Robin and she sent it over. Um, and she's done a lovely job putting this together on the left-hand column, where to plant, indoors, when to transplant, and then outdoors to direct seed. And then across the top is the months. And so you can see here in late Ooh. February, early March, we have all of our onions. And then let's see, they go outside. Where are they going outside? Is she pretty good to put them outside? Oh, transplant, I'm looking at them out. So yeah, right here in mid-April is when you put them outside. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong row. Or you can also put them out in early May. We just put our onions out uh, Monday. We just transplanted all our onions out into the field. So see, she does have here tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants mid-March to mid-April. So I was saying we're right on the cusp of starting those inside. And then we plant those outside in June. So this is a great resource. I would print this out. Um, you'll be able to access this from the Free the Seas website, but I would print this out and put that in your garden calendar or wherever you keep your garden supplies. Um, Free the Seeds also has a wonderful YouTube channel. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but for the last three years, I believe, uh, the workshops there have been recorded, edited, and are up online. You can access those from the Free the Seeds website. Click on Build, build Skills, and it will bring you to our YouTube channel. And there are seed starting workshops there, as well as beekeeping, canning, cooking, soil amendments. Also, if you want to listen to me talk some more, I did... Uh, Earlier this summer, this is our little propagation greenhouse, a little over a seven minute video, uh, more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, and you can find that on our Instagram page at Wicked Good Produce. And there you're gonna hear some of the same things, but you can see the texture of our soil as we've moistened it and how I planted and made some marks in the tray. And it's kind of a repeat, but it's short, it's only seven minutes. Um, also, I'm going to put a little plug in for Free the Seeds here. If you have anything in your garden that's growing and going to seed, we need you to grow seeds for our community. Um, I don't know if you have all have your seeds for this year. If you don't have seeds already for this year, it's going to be challenging to find them, particularly with COVID-19. A lot, I've noticed a lot of the big seed companies on that line and little ones are now only selling to commercial growers because the seed volume and the seed demands have been so high. Um, I was at, at Nelson's Ace Hardware recently. Their seed racks are, are almost empty. Um, it's just people are wanting to grow their own food, which I think is wonderful. I think it's great. I think everyone should grow as much food as they can. Um, but in order to build a more resilient local seed bank, we need you to help grow seeds. Um, and uh, I've learned it's not. Even if you have chives in your garden that are going to seed, get in touch with Farmhands, info at farmhandsnourish.com, and they will help you with all your seed saving questions and even flower seeds. 
um, or if you have tomatoes that are cracked, you know, or, or something, uh, but they're red, those can be saved. If you have that ginormous zucchini that you're like gonna put in the compost pile, we can save that seed for you too. So anyway, we need your help. Um, our community needs your help with that. Okay, and then if you do have any other questions, I put down here, uh, you can email me at brooke at wikipediaproduce.com with questions. Um, and we, I think we have a few minutes probably before Zoom kicks us off uh, for some more questions. Yeah, I just wanted, before we get to the final questions, to make sure we have time here. Um, we are under that build skills section on freetoseedsmontana.com. Um, I am redoing that this weekend, hopefully. And this recording, as well as resources we mentioned, and maybe, Brooke, we can cross links to your seed starting workshop. Yeah. Um, we're redesigning that whole section so that we will keep an archive of all these sessions along with resources that go with it. And I'll cross link our workshop videos from previous Free to Seeds under the respective categories where they are um, available. Also, for the upcoming series, um, Brooke mentioned seed starting and all that good stuff. We will have a full session both on, you know, preparing to think about the plants that you might want to save the seeds from, as well as a practical workshop um, in September on how to harvest seeds. So we'll have lots of good resources around that and lots of support and hopefully build our local seed population. Oh, I do have an answer to a question that somebody sent in. Um, shade tolerant planting. Um, if you're an individual who sent that in, that's a great question. And I would like to say that I think a lot of plants do better in the shade than we think. We always think that our gardens have to be full sun. That July and August sun is intense. Um, so if you have a shady yard, it's okay. The hardest thing, um, I think is like when you have plants that you've started inside and you take them and you put them out in the direct sun, you can actually sunburn your plants. Um, so you do want to harden them off a little bit. Like if they're inside your house under lights, put them outside for a few days, for a few hours and get them acclimated to the wind and the sun. But shady plants, um, you know, your peas, your beans, potatoes, beets, garlic, carrots, onions, I think, Whoever asked that question, that's a great question. I would say try it. Um, you know your spinach and your uh, cilantro are gonna do great there, <laughs> for sure. Your winter squash maybe will have a harder time. It's those really heat loving plants that are gonna might have a harder time, but just try it. We have time for one final question and I have one from Corey. Can you plant garlic in the spring? Ah, that's a great question. If you do, you will end up with one ginormous clove. Instead of a bulb with multiple cloves, you're gonna end up with this monster clove, which isn't so bad if you don't mind eating a big clove of garlic, but you can also use that to plant in the fall. But I really, uh, unless it's been stored in the refrigerator so it feels like it's gone through winter, you, it will grow, but it just may not be what you want it to be. The best is to plant your garlic um, that, like in early, end of September, early October, and then it winters perfect. over and makes a bulb. Well, perfect. I think um, we are out of time. Thank you guys for showing up on time. Um, we will start all future sessions exactly on the hour because we have limited Zoom time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brooke. This has been fantastic. Really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing you all um, at the next session. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so 